again, good morning, everyone. For those of you watching, listening, or clicking on this video, thank you for um, honoring us here at the church. It really is humbling, and it really does mean a lot to us that you decided to, out of all the hundreds and thousands of videos that are out there, that you decided to check us out. Um, I hope that you're blessed. Um, I hope that this message really touches your heart. Um, and if it does, uh, please, a couple things I want you to do. One of them, let us know. And the other thing, please pass the video along. It could also touch the hearts of others. So, so as I said, we'll be finishing off uh, the book of Ruth today. Ruth chapter 4. And uh, I titled today's message, Faith's Reward. So before I begin reading the last of this chapter, this book, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to speak to us through His Word. Heavenly Father, yes, we are so looking forward to the day that we are in heaven and we're able to say, yes, Lord, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You are worthy. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Now, Lord, we pray that you will speak to us powerfully through your word. Through these last few verses, last few passages of the book of Ruth, Lord. We know that you have a message there for everyone. So we know that your word, it's not... It's going to go out there powerfully. I believe that. I know that. And your word says that. So now, I pray that you will silence the world that's all around us, Lord. And let us just focus on what you have to say. May we not concern ourselves with what's going on in the news around the world, what's going on with the elections, Lord, what's going on in just even in our own homes, Lord. Let us just focus on what you have to say through your word. Lord, we need you desperately in this time. So minister to us, speak to us, and fill everyone here with the Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So I'm going to start off with just reading the first two verses and then stop there, talk about that a little bit, and then read the rest of the chapter. Ruth chapter 4, verse 11. The Word of God says, All the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who was entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Ephrathah and your name uh, well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the house, I mean, the son of Tamar, uh, the, the son Tamar born to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. So as soon as that sandal was given to Boaz, the transaction was complete. It was done. So not only, as I said in the beginning, did, he, did Boaz, not, Boaz now have the legal right to possess the land that once belonged to Naomi's dead husband, but it also meant that he could marry Ruth and then eventually pass that land down to their children. So when all the people and the elders who were at the city gate saw this transaction take place, three things occurred. First of all, they all became legal witnesses that the right of redemption had indeed occurred. Now, this explains why a marriage ceremony it's so important, and why it should be recognized by the civil authorities. I'm not just talking about the church in general, but also the civil authorities. 
See, Boaz had a love for Ruth that was public, a love that wanted to be that wanted to be publicly witnessed and registered. Sometimes people wonder why a marriage ceremony or a marriage license is important. Can't we just be married before God? But there's something severely lacking in a love that doesn't want to proclaim itself, that doesn't want witnesses, and doesn't want the bond to be recognized by civil authorities. See, that love falls short, falls short of true marital love. So those who say, well, if we were on a desert island and no one was there to marry us, could we still be married before God? Need to hear the answer. Yes, on a desert island, but you're, you're not on a desert island. There are witnesses and civil authorities for you to proclaim your commitment of merited love to. God wants you to do it. Now, the second thing that occurred was that all those witnesses celebrated this event. It truly is a wonderful thing when the covenant community sincerely rejoices with the bride and groom because what they're doing is in the will of God. Someone once said that marriage is a mistake that every man should make. But in all reality, the, pla the last place you want to make a mistake is at the marriage altar, before God and before people. You see, as I mentioned a bit ago, and contrary to what some people believe, marriage isn't a private affair. The sacred union includes God and God's people. And every bride and groom should want the blessing of God and God's people on their marriage. And so it brings me to the third thing that occurred when all the elders and the people witnessed that redemption transaction take place. And that was that they pronounced blessings. They first blessed Ruth in verse 11. May the Lord make the woman who was entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. Now, in what way were the people of Bethlehem thinking God would bless Ruth like Rachel and Leah? Well, the most obvious is, well, it's plainly stated. God's blessing on Ruth would build the house of Israel. But you see, it seems to me that it's more than just a continuation of Elimelech's family line that they have in mind. I truly believe they see God's blessings on Ruth as building up the entire nation of Israel. You see, we know that in just a few generations, this will result in the Davidic dynasty. And also, eventually, long after that, the line in which the Messiah will come. So as you can see, church, that truly is building up the nation of Israel. So then, another question. Why do those witnesses pronounce blessing on Ruth that would make her like Rachel and Leah? Well, besides the fact that both Rachel and Leah, along with their handmaids, they produced the patriarch, patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I think there's a more subtle blessing here. That of being able, uh, that of being enabled to conceive. In Genesis 30, we're told that Rachel and Leah were unable to conceive. 
but then God opened their wombs, then they were able to. We know from earlier chapters, uh, the earlier chapters of Ruth, that she had borne no children. And then here in verse 13, we're told that God granted conception to her. So thus, this blessing may have, may, um, may have assumed that God would open up Ruth's, Ruth's womb so that she could bear children and thus, again, build the house of Israel. All those witnesses, all those people that were there would be, were praying that Ruth would be fruitful in bearing children. See, in Israel back then, children were considered a blessing and not a burden. They took the words in Psalm 127, verse 3, seriously. There it says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. They are a reward from Him. Sadly, though, that's not the attitude of our society today. Of our society today. I'm not sure if you knew this, but in the United States each year, over a million babies are legally destroyed in the womb. And the pieces of their bodies that are removed, they're removed as though they were cancerous tumors. A Christian nurse working at a hospital told the pastor this. In one part of our hospital, we're working day and night to keep babies alive. In another part, we're murdering them. What's God going to say? Yes, children are a gift of the Lord, and they are a reward for him, from Him. We need, as, as a people, as a society, we need to stop looking at this issue as you know, children that are unborn is just things that can be rid of so easily. They're a blessing. God has a plan for each and every one of those babies. We need to get back to that place. We need to be like that again, to that place where we do consider having children as an honorable thing, as a good thing that needs to be promoted and that needs to be just said and talked about everywhere. All right. Well, after they proclaimed a blessing for Ruth, the people at the city gate, well, now they focus on Boaz. First, they tell him, may you be powerful in Ephrathah and your name well known in Bethlehem. The people wanted Boaz to prosper and to be fruitful in his marriage. Now, there's a lot of um, debate. Commentators have, uh, have differed as far as what that word Ephrathah means. But in the context that we're seeing it here, that's what it it's more, more than likely means, that he prosper and be fruitful in his marriage. But not only that, they hope that his name would become well-known and bring honor to their little town. Bethlehem, you see, was already well known because Genesis thirty-five nineteen records that it was a place where Rachel was buried. But little did, did anyone know that Bethlehem would eventually be known as a place where Jesus Christ was born. The people's third blessing was towards Boaz's house. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar born of Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. Here, the people perceive that what Boaz did, what Boaz did was honorable and praiseworthy. But I believe they were also aware of the sacrifices Boaz is making to fulfill his obligations. 
which is why I really think they pronounce these blessings on him. So they were basically saying, may even greater prosperity and fame come upon Boaz through Ruth and the offspring God will produce through her. It's amazing, really it is. It's amazing to see the wonderful changes that came into Ruth's life because she trusted Boaz and let him work on her behalf. Ruth. Ruth, she went from loneliness to love, from toil to rest, from poverty to wealth, from worry to assurance, and from despair to hope. She was no longer Ruth the Moabitess, for the past was gone, and she was making a new beginning. She was now Ruth, the wife of Boaz, a name she was proud to bear. As believers, as Christians, this kind of applies to us too. We're no longer, I'm no longer Angel the sinner. No. I'm not. I'm now known as angel, the son of God, child of God, born again into the family of God. Many of you need to start seeing yourselves that way too. You're no longer that person that you once were that sinner that messed up so many times, that alcoholic, that adulterer, that fornicator, that addict, that person that you hated and that you hate now thinking about. You're no longer that person. God sees you now as his child. The moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the moment the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, you became His. He is in you and you're in Him. You're now His child. So don't be defined by all those things. Yes, I know at times they come to mind, they come and creep in, and you are reminded of the things that you've done or the things that you did. It's painful and it hurts. I know it does for me. Then I close my eyes and I remember. Recall what Jesus did on the cross. And he did that for me. And yes, he did that for you too. Don't forget that. That's, that's my advice is when those thoughts, those memories start creeping up and the devil starts telling you that you're not good enough, that you're just a failure, that you're just going to fail again, remind yourself what Jesus did and that your Redeemer lives and he's alive right now sitting at the right hand of God interceding for you think about all that Jesus suffered to set you free yes you were once a sinner but now you're not you're a child of God. Now, one of the many images of the church in the Bible is that it's known as the bride of Christ. 
In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 33, the emphasis is on Christ's love for the church as seen in his ministries. He died for the church, which is the past. He cleanses and nourishes the church through the word, which is the present. And he will one day present the church in glory, which is the future. So again, past, present, and future. We, as the church, and yes, even as small as we are, we're part of that. We are his bride. Revelation 19 tells us that, tells us that Christ is preparing a beautiful home for his bride. And one day, we'll, ce we'll celebrate his wedding. And as his bride, we're going to be just as joyful as, his, as him. Celebrating along, alongside of him. All right, now in this last section that we'll be reading, we're going to be seeing a second set of blessings. So let's uh, read about those now. Pick up in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. He slept with her, and the Lord granted conception to her, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap and became his nanny. The neighbor woman said, a son, the neighbor woman said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the family records of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fa fathered Am Am Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And that concludes the book of Ruth. So, verse 13 there tells us that upon marrying, Boaz consummated the marriage. And that afterwards, God blessed Ruth by allowing her to get pregnant and give birth to a son. But God showed grace toward her, towards Ruth, long before her pregnancy. Let me show you a few ways how. God had been gracious to Ruth back in Moab by giving her the faith to trust him and be saved. His grace continued when she moved to Bethlehem, for he guided her to the field of Boaz, where Boaz fell in love with her. God's grace continued at the town gate, where the nearest kinsman rejected Ruth, and Boaz purchased her. And as we just read, after the marriage, God poured out his grace on Ruth and, and Boaz, by granting conception to her and then giving her a safe delivery of a son whom they named Obed, which means servant. Well, after this, in verses 14 through 22, it tells us that God would use this baby as the source of blessing to many. I'll give you five examples. Obed was a blessing to Boaz and Ruth. This was no ordinary baby because it was God's special gift to Boaz and Ruth. 
and what a little what a little blessing or what a blessing little Obed was to their home. But every baby is a special gift from God and should be treated that way. Every baby deserves a loving home and caring parents who want to raise the child in the training and admonition of the Lord. What a great privilege it is to bring a new life into the world and then guide that life so that it matures to become all that God has planned. But two, Obed was also a blessing to Naomi. His grandmother informally adopted him as her own son and basically became his foster mother. Although the title they gave her was Nanny, but you said it also says that she was like a mother. The women of Bethlehem shared Naomi's joy when they said in verse 14, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. Keep in mind that this reference is to Obed, not Boaz. You see, Naomi, you see, to Naomi, Obed was a restorer of life. Now, I'm not a grandparent yet, but those who are probably agree that grandchildren, having grandchildren is way better than the fountain of youth. Why? Because they get their youth back when their child, grandchildren come to visit. Though not all parents agree with it, grandparents agree with it, they all know the saying, they're called grandchildren because they're grand when they come and grand when they leave. There's no better way to get a new lease on life than to start investing yourself in the younger generation. Every baby that's born into this world is a vote for the future. And grandparents need to focus on the future and not the past. When you're holding a baby, remember, you're holding the future in your arms. Obed would be a blessing to, Na to Naomi another way. He would one day care for the family that brought him into the world, including his grandmother, Naomi. Boaz had redeemed the family inheritance. Now Obed would continue the family line, protect the inheritance, and use it to sustain Naomi. He would live up to his name and be a servant to Naomi, his foster mother. The guarantee for this ministry would not be the law of the land, but the love of Ruth for her mother-in-law. Obed would learn early to love Naomi, even as Ruth loved her. Obed was an only son, but his affection for his mother and his grandmother would be equal to that of seven sons. Number three, Obed would bring blessing to Bethlehem. The child would bring faith to the family name and the name to his native town. Elimelech's name almost disappeared from Israel, but Obed would make that name famous and bring glory to Bethlehem. This happened, of course, through the life and ministry of King David and of David's greater son. Jesus Christ. Naomi would have the comfort of knowing that the family name would not perish, but increase in fame. Number four, Obed would bring blessing to Israel. Obed was the grandfather of King David. 
one of Israel's greatest rulers. When the name of David is mentioned, we usually think of either Goliath or Bathsheba. David did commit a great sin. He did mess up greatly. But he was also a great man of faith whom God used to build the kingdom of Israel. He led the people in overcoming their enemies, expanding their inheritance, and most of all, worshiping their God. He wrote worship songs for the Levites to sing and devised musical instruments for them to play. He spent a lifetime gathering wealth for the building of the temple, and God gave him the plans for the temple so Solomon, his son, could do the job. So whether he had his hand, whether he had in his hand a sling or a sword, a harp or a hymnal, David was a great servant of God who brought untold blessings to Israel. And finally, fifth, Obed would bring blessing to the whole world. The greatest thing God did for David wasn't to give him victory over his enemies or wealth for the building of the temple. The greatest privilege God gave him was that of being the ancestor of the Messiah. David wanted to build a house for God, but God told him that he would build a house or a family for David. David knew that the Messiah would come from the kingly tribe of Judah, but nobody knew which family in Judah would be chosen. Well, if you know the story, you know that God chose David's family, and the Redeemer would be known forever as the son of David. So you see, little did those Bethlehemites know that God had great plans for that little boy. Obed would have a son named Jesse, and Jesse would have eight sons, the youngest of which would be David the king. Remember that next time you see a baby or a child, that little one might be one, might be someone that God has planned to have a great future. They could be the next Chuck Smith, Billy Graham, Corey Ten Boom. Could be the next great evangelist, next great author. next person that brings revival to this country. Pray for that child. Pray that God would move in, in his or her life and that they will become that God, they will become the person that God is destined for them to become. Pray for that grandchild. Pray for that child. Pray for that nephew, that niece. God may use them to do some great things. But here, let me also tell you this. Check this out. If you remember a few weeks ago, I mentioned that according to Deuteronomy 23.3, the, Moabite, the Moabites were prohibited from entering the congregation of the Lord even to the 10th generation. But this little book of Ruth closes with a 10-generation genealogy that climaxes with the name of David. When I saw that, when I read that, I was like blown away. Church. Never underestimate the power of the grace of God. 
Folks, let me tell you another mind-blowing fact. Naomi's return to Bethlehem, the roots of David in Bethlehem, going, uh, going back to Ruth and Boaz, are why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to register in the census of Augustus. That story is told in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So you see, in a way, Ruth and Boaz are the reason why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Let me repeat that. Naomi's return to Bethlehem and the roots of David in Bethlehem, going back to Ruth and Boaz, are why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to register in the census of Augustus. It's crazy. It's a mind, I, that also blew me away. Well, the consideration of Jesus in the booth, book of Ruth doesn't begin with the mention of King David. See, Jesus has been through the whole book, pictured by Boaz and the office of the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer had to be a family member. Jesus added humanity to his eternal deity so that he could be our kinsman and save us. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying family members out of slavery. Jesus redeemed us from, sla from the slavery, from slavery to sin and death. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying back the land that had been forfeited. Jesus will redeem the earth that mankind sold over to Satan. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, wasn't motivated by self-interest, but motivated by love for Ruth. Jesus' motivation for redeeming us, redeeming you, is his great love for you. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, had a plan to redeem Ruth unto himself. And some might have thought that the plan was foolish. Jesus has a plan to redeem us. And some might think that that plan also is foolish. Saving men by dying for them on a cross. Yet, here's the thing, the plan works and it's glorious. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, took her as his bride. The people Jesus has redeemed are collectively called his bride. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, provided a glorious destiny for Ruth. Jesus, as our Redeemer, provides a glorious destiny for us. But it all comes back to the idea of Jesus as our kinsman Redeemer. This is why he became a man. God might have sent an angel to save us, but the angel would have been, wouldn't have been our kinsman. Jesus in his eternal glory, without the addition of his divine nature, might have saved us. But he wouldn't have been our kinsman. A great prophet or priest would be our kinsman. But his own sin would have disqualified him as our redeemer. Only Jesus, my friends, only Jesus, the eternal God, who added humanity to his eternal deity can both can be both kinsman and the redeemer for mankind. Isaiah chapter 54 verses 4 through 8 describes the beautiful ministry of our Lord as our kinsman redeemer. Do not be afraid, for you will not be put to shame. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. 
For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and wounded in spirit. I will have compassion on you with everlasting love. Let me repeat that line again. I will have compassion on you with everlasting love, says the Lord, your Redeemer. From eternity, God planned to bring Ruth and Boaz together and thus make Bethlehem his entrance point for the coming of Jesus as our true kinsman redeemer, fully God and fully man. Spiritually, we need to come to Bethlehem and let Jesus redeem us. As it is written in the Christmas hymn, and I hope we, we get a chance to play it. We start playing uh, one, usually one or two Christmas hymns um, right after Thanksgiving if you haven't been with us. But as it is written in the Christmas hymn, O little town of Bethlehem, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless, and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but the world but in the world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to, her, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide it with us, our Lord Emmanuel. So now, in closing, church, friends, those watching and listening, there are many lessons that we've covered here in the book of Ruth. But one of the lessons, let me just touch upon one of the lessons that we learned here. One of the lessons that this book teaches us is that Doing what is right in God's eyes requires living by faith. Ruth exercised great faith in leaving her family and homeland to dwell in Israel and placing herself under, under the protective wings of God. Boaz exercised faith when he gave the nearest kin the first option to carry out his obligations. He exercised faith by fathering a son who would be the heir of a kinsman, who would be the heir of a kinsman. Doing what is right in your own eyes, doing what is right in your own eyes is living by sight. Doing what is right in God's eyes requires faith. Because you see, you often cannot see how doing the right thing will produce what God has promised. So now let me end. Let me close by asking you this question, my friend, or these questions. Who do you trust? Are you living your life by doing what is right in your own eyes? Let me tell you, that's the spirit of our postmodern world. And frankly, to be honest with you, to tell you the truth, it's dead wrong. We must see things as God does. And it's only when God, God's word presents God's perspective on man, on right and wrong. Let me repeat that. 
We must see things as God does. And it's only God's word. It's only God's word that presents God's perspective on man, on right and wrong, and on man's eternal destiny. You will never get to heaven by doing what is right in your own eyes. From this book, we should see ourselves as unworthy, as unworthy sinners who need salvation from a source outside of ourselves, from God. Well, my friends, as I mentioned briefly before, that salvation has been provided by God in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's only by acknowledging your sin, acknowledging your sin and recognizing that you deserve God's eternal wrath and then trusting in the death of Jesus Christ and bearing your eternal punishment that you will ever get to heaven. He, He alone, no one else, He alone bore the penalty of your sin and He alone provides the righteousness in which God requires to enter into heaven. So don't trust yourself when it comes to your own eternal destiny. Trust in Him. Trust in Jesus, who alone can save. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Obey Him. If you see, if you see your need for a Savior today, right now, at this very moment, all you have to do is call out to Him. Admit you're a sinner. Repent of your sins. Ask Him to forgive you. Confess Him as your Lord and Savior. And He will come and He will, he will deliver you. He will free you. He will forgive you. As I said last week, you've been redeemed. If you're ready right now, if you're watching, listening, if you're here, and you're ready, for Jesus to come into your heart, to make Him the Lord and Savior of your life, I want you to stop what you're doing right now. If you're driving, geez, if you can pull over in the side of the road, do that. But wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So with all sincerity, with all your heart, pray this. <coughs> Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now repent for those sins and turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born-again life. In 
your name. Amen. For those who have walked away from the Lord and found it difficult to come back, you're not sure how or you're not sure if Jesus forgive you again for just messing up for the millionth time, let me tell you, he will. And if that's you, pray this. Jesus, I'm sorry, I've blown it again. Forgive me. Lord, give me the strength. Stand back up to walk with you again. I know you love me and you care for me and yet you have not abandoned me. So give me that strength. Give me that fire you gave me so many years ago. That fire that I had in the beginning, may it burn brightly. May it burn brighter than the sun sun itself. Use me once again as your instrument. Thank you for dying for me. In your name, amen. If you're watching this and you pray that, reach out to us. You want to hear your story. You want to hear how that came to be. Um, We want to rejoice with you. We want to celebrate with you. If you need help in your next steps of your new Christian walk, um, let us know and uh, we can help you with that as well. Maybe help you find a church or whatever it may be. Just, you know, we want to celebrate with you. You are now a child of God. Uh, You're now part of the family of God. So um, there's all kinds of angels rejoicing right now as a result of that. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Uh, in the meantime, please take care of yourselves. Um, may you be, be blessed. May you be a blessing to others. Um, and just be a, a light there on a, on a shining hill. Um, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.